Okay, we are live. I want to introduce you guys to Devin Smiley, who is a negotiation consultant. Um, and it's pretty obvious why I've decided to have her on here for Digital Strategy School, because I think talking about money is, um, is or can be pretty awkward and just getting the rates that you um, that you want as you move more from, you know, design into strategy is really, really important. So, uh, Devin, I'd love to know a bit more about your journey, how you got into negotiation consulting, and I'm really curious about whether talking about money has always been uh, comfortable for you. How did you even stumble into that? <laughs> well, it, it certainly isn't the kind of thing you grow up thinking you're going to do. I think I wanted to be a ballet dancer, so uh, negotiation wasn't at all in my, <laughs> in my vision. Um, I actually got into negotiation by way of procurement. I started working right out of university as a buyer. And at first I thought, oh, those people who negotiate, that's the most boring job in the world. I can't believe they do that every day. And then I had the opportunity to work on some portfolios that had really great contracts and some that had really crappy contracts. And that was sort of like the switch flipped because I knew, oh, wait, there's more to this. If you can do a good job negotiating, it makes life so much easier. And just out of curiosity, when you say contracts, do you also, do you see the contracts and proposals as being two separate things? Is that a two-step process for you? I know every designer is a little bit different in terms of when they just put the initial estimate together and then when you actually agree upon what the... Exactly. I see it as a two-step process, um, but to go into the proposal with the end game in mind because the more elements you're going to want in the contract that you can tie into your original proposal, the easier it will be when it comes time to actually get the contract in place. And, uh, you know, just off the top of your head, I'm sure you see, um, you know, problem, <laughs> problems all the time. But what are some of the main things that people miss when they're negotiation? Like, what do people leave on the table? And what, um, you know, what are the consequences of leaving things on the table other than just not getting what you want out of a project? Mm -hmm. I think people, everyone gets kind of nervous and you just sort of want to hurry through the process. So there's a tendency to be like, yeah, 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 that's good enough. Um, and you're thinking about 10 feet ahead of you, just like get the contract signed and get the client work started without taking the longer view of, will this actually work for me a year from now? So you <laughs> think that people don't think far enough in advance? They don't. They don't. They get very excited about starting the new project. They're excited because the rate is something that, yes, money, but the other terms, the way the relationship will work, the asking the what ifs, like what if it all goes horribly wrong and not having something in place to then deal with that. And, and that's something pretty common. I find a lot of designers, um, they plan for the best case scenario, like they sort of design their proposals for the best case scenario. And I'm sure you see that all the time and you kind of forget about those what ifs, what could go wrong, what if the scope increases, you know, how do you even deal with that if, you know, a week or two weeks into a project you realize, oh man, I totally underbid here, like I, I'd love to know from you, is that, is that even open for, you know, discussion? I'm assuming it's best to kind of get things in place the first time. It is. Uh, there's actually a lot of, people tend to think of a contract as being very restrictive, and in some ways it is but there are opportunities to build flexibility in. So something like a renegotiation clause. Mm. And you can see that with businesses of all sizes is that they'll set certain parameters. Uh, for example, if you know, the hours per month exceeds you know, plus 10% on what the estimate was, there's an opportunity to reopen the negotiation. Um, which if you think especially you're starting with a client and it's rather small, but you can see their vision and how big it will become, building in something like that gives you the opportunity to at least have a new discussion about it rather than getting sort of shackled into doing the work. And I know that one place that might get a little tricky, and um, I love your insights on this because... Um, Obviously, there's hourly work, there's, you know, flat fee, there's value-based. And so, um, obviously, let's assume people are actually tracking their hours, but let's say they're moving more towards a value-based model. How do you then say, oh, wait, I'm actually going to be giving you much more value? How do you measure that, right, in a, in a contract? Uh, it, it's difficult. It's really difficult. A lot of it um, can usually be resolved by getting creative with the client and discussing how they see the project going and 
um, together coming up with the metric that works. A lot of times we'll see that one side of the conversation has a very firm metric in mind, and then they present it to the other guy, like, what are you talking about? That's not going to work. <laughs> so, so the collaboration on figuring out where we see ourselves going, what metrics are the best for our specific business. That's that's brings up another um, another great question that I have, and I'd love to know your opinion on this. Is um, who starts the conversation with the dollar amount? You know, do you ask the client, okay, what kind of budget do you have to work with? Because I know, at least in the design industry, um, a lot of people haven't worked with a designer before, and they have no idea what to expect. So they're coming to the designer saying, um, well, I'm not really sure, you know, what's involved. So could you tell me what you think that's going to cost, right? And so I'd love to know that that <laughs> delicate tiptoe. Who who kind of starts, and uh, you know, does one person have more power when they mm. when they kind of say their number first? I'd love to know. This is like the classic negotiation, chicken and egg. <laughs> um, from my perspective, I think that there's a lot of power in providing a number first. Uh, one of the reasons for that is exactly as you mentioned, the clients coming in probably don't really have a sense of what you're doing. <laughs> it's sort of like if someone asked me, what's your budget for getting your roof redone? <laughs> I don't know, $100? Like I, I have no concept. So it's important to provide the number first. It's an educational tool. And the power in it comes in that you're setting the, the starting point for the discussion. Um, so then, no matter what the client had in mind, they're now aware this is where the conversation starts. And so, um, would you say that showing some kind of starting at price too on websites, like uh, that's that's something that I typically do is say project start at this, or at least giving some kind of ballpark range so that the <laughs> client, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's definitely the way to go. Um, it gives you uh, again the power of having made that first statement but you still have the flexibility because every project will be unique. Nothing is going to be an exact replica of a past project. So it gives you the flexibility to adjust upwards as you need to. Um, okay, so let's say you give, you give the client your sort of ballpark range or um, let's say after your discussion you realize there's actually a lot more work involved than when you first gave them the ballpark range and you give them that price and their jaw drops uh, what happens next? You know, what, what room is there to um, communicate? The, I'm assuming communicating your value is going to be a huge part of being able to negotiate. So what happens then when the client is like, whoa, 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 hold the phone? <laughs> well, that's where negotiation and sales are sort of like sisters. I consider them for a business person. Um, the communication of what you're bringing to the deal, the expertise. Um, how much benefit they're going to be seeing from it. Um, sometimes it can just help to give them some time to digest that number. Um, I think a good part, like money for me, hasn't always been comfortable. Um, and what's helped take the sting out of it is working on some deals with, like, numbers I think are imaginary. They're so high. <laughs> and you sort of, you, you get a little numbed to it. So it's a little sticker shock. Give the client some time, then start into the discussion, explaining all the value. But also ask them questions to see if maybe there's something non-monetary that's involved in your deal that isn't optimal for them. And can you give an example? Um, an example of that could be they might be a bit you might give them the quote and they seem upset or they're not as eager as they were right before you gave it to them. Um, asking a question about, well, what's the concern in moving forward as this is? And getting them to discuss with you how they're feeling about it, elements other than the money. Um, a great example of this with a client is uh, they had sent over a proposal and the person was like gangbusters, so excited, but they just couldn't get them to sign. It, something was wrong. And it was asking that question. And it turned out that it was really a concern about the meetings are going to be downtown, but there's rush hour traffic. And 
I'm concerned I'm going to spend two hours getting to our meeting. And I was like, oh, well, we can deal with that. And my client didn't have to all of a sudden drop his price 20% to try and get the signature. Right. So sometimes it's not always just about the money. It's it's about the, money. <laughs> even the timeline. Does the timeline work? Are you willing to pay more for uh, a shorter timeline and things like that? I'm exactly. Sure. A great uh, element of that is a pay for performance almost. Like standard price is X amount, but I can cut a third off that timeline if you're willing to give me an extra 20%. <laughs> Which is quite common in most sort of product fields. If you need a manufacturer to do something quickly, you pay the expedite fee. Can work the same with you guys. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, I know a lot of people do charge rush fees and that sort of thing. So, um, okay. So, you know, for the for the typical introvert, uh, being super super scared to put their price forward, do you have any like really basic tactics or just sort of things to consider before they? Um, you know, rush to agree to a number or kind of throw out, throw out a number that, um, you know, devalues maybe what they do, where mm -hmm. should somebody start? Um, well, especially for being introverted, I know it's difficult to actually say a number. Um, <laughs> you, you can get really tongue-tied. And that's where the opportunity comes that you'll say the number, but then your, your tone of voice, your, your body language will completely undermine that that's a good number. Uh, you get very apologetic by accident. So my number one suggestion would be is to put it in writing, to include it with a bit of a softer language. Um, it's often easier to warm up to saying a number in writing. So the start of the email, very genial. Hey, how are you? It was great to discuss with you. I'm really excited about working on this project with you. The key things like why I am so excited are A, B, C, D, E. The package price for this looks like it will be X dollars. I, I have a question about that too. I mean, I know I tem um, tend to take on a very personal approach with my clients. I have no problem being uh, very cordial in emails. Um, in terms of negotiation strategy, you know, is there, um, are there any hard and fast rules about, you know, being serious, like emails being short, you know, like things that actually work, that you know work better, or? I find that a personal approach works well 95% of the time. At the end of the day, uh, a negotiation is a discussion. It's one person talking to another person, trying to come up with something that works for both of them. So keeping the human element in that works wonders. Um, even things as simple as being polite, saying please, saying thank you, which seem crazy obvious, but it, it seems to go a long way. Um, when there are times when you need to switch modes, um, even if you've been very personable with a client before, I like to actually say very clearly, okay, I'm putting on my business hat now which usually gets a giggle, <laughs> but to send the clear indicator that even though we've been talking in one manner with each other, I need to switch gears right now. Creates a nice divide uh, where people tend not to take things too personally after you've been firm with that. I like that. So uh, keeping polite and for the introvert, sort of putting it in writing, taking a bit of a softer approach, um, do you, do you ever do your negotiations by, by phone or in person? Or let's say you're presenting a proposal. Is, it, you know, is there any advantage to actually presenting a proposal either through Skype or on the phone? I think that's a great follow-up step, is to send over the proposal, time to digest. Um, it's always a little awkward if the first time someone's seeing something, they're also looking you in the eye. Um, that's awkward for both people most of the time. That's so good. So sending it over, they can digest and then book a call the next day to walk them through, which would be really helpful if there's anything um, at all ambiguous or that they might not exactly be on board with. It gives you the opportunity to show your enthusiasm and to show the value before they've made a decision. 
And in terms of coming up with a price and, you know, ma you know making an offer that a client feels comfortable with, I'm, I'm curious if you, if you ever have this situation where what if a project is ambiguous? Like what if a lot of the deliverables aren't, aren't yet determined and or um, you know, something that I do is a discovery process first. And so, you know, do you suggest a price for a discovery process and then let's, we'll follow up and get more concrete details on the full project. Like I'm curious if you've ever had that happen and how you handle it. I love that because a lot of business, there'll be the first few weeks is sort of when you're, you're trying things on and shaking things out. So doing a preliminary engagement. Um, so that could be maybe the deal is limited. We're going to work together for a month and it's more strategy consulting kickoff shaking getting all the nuts and bolts out with an eye to then signing a further agreement but if at the end of that month it's going to be a ginormous project one you've still gotten paid for all the work you did for them that month helping them define <laughs> it's not free <laughs> <laughs> but both of you then have the opportunity to either continue the relationship or go in a separate direction. And do you, do you think it's worth outlining um, either a range or something for, you know, here's what I imagine that full scope to be, but we won't know that until we've done the discovery. You know, is it of any benefit to even give them a ballpark at that point? Or is it sort of, there's no point in speculating, you might as well focus on that phase one. Um, I think it depends on the client and the vibe you're getting from them. A lot of times when you say, okay, I think this is going to be the range, but it's not written in stone, people will respect that. And when it comes time to have the discussion again, they'll be fine. Um, if you get the feeling from the client that they're very, very by the book or more old school or corporate in their feel, uh, then avoiding giving the range is probably the better move. And um, I, I know in one of your points you were saying, uh, like tackling mindset, combative versus collaborative against and together. Is that just a matter of, again, seeing seeing that it's just a discussion between two people? It's not you against me. It's like, what is the number that's going to make us both feel like we're both getting mm -hmm. a really good end of the deal? Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, first of all, reframing it as I'm not there to negotiate, I'm there to discuss, gets you most of the way in mindset. Um, and then it's sort of training yourself and watching your language. Um, you know, I've come from a very corporate background where saying you're negotiating against someone, that's what, just what you did. Uh, so even retraining myself <laughs> in my own business uh, to view it not as combative, but as collaborative. Collaborative it really helps. Um, and so uh, the, the number one question that you get asked is, how do I become a great negotiator? How does one become a great negotiator? Exactly. <laughs> and the good news is the answer is a lot simpler than spend a decade in the corporate environment doing it. <laughs> <You've>, <laughs> I took the long way around. <laughs> but it comes down to two main things. The first is practice. And in the business setting, the idea of practicing makes us very nervous because there's something on the line there. So if you're very uncomfortable with negotiation, practice asking for things outside of your business. And something for me that I'd always really struggled with and have had to force myself to get comfortable with is going to a cafe and asking for something not exactly on the menu. The first time I walked into like, chain chain cafe and asked for an extra something or other in my latte i was like sweating <laughs> you are sweating <laughs> so now i can do it no problem but it's finding opportunities in your life with with your friends family when you're out interacting in the world to get comfortable asking for things not being apologetic about it and you just you get used to it so number one is practice and the second key is preparation because nothing is worse than just kind of thinking you can wing it <laughs> like flying by the seat of your pants so when you prepare to ask for something or to negotiate with a client uh, it's important to consider what's most valuable for you what are you wanting what are you needing what sort of priorities are you coming in with but to also do that same exercise 
for the client. Um, and it doesn't have to be a whole lengthy process. It's like one post-it note for each of you. But you want to try on what their mindset could be because it means that when you're actually in the discussion with them, you're less likely to be caught off guard by something. Uh, the proactive approach lets you sort of drive the discussion where you want it to go while still accommodating what their interests will be. I, I love that because, um, you know, I was just talking to the students the other day about how I feel like empathy is such an important part of business and just being able to, you know, come at it and just see where, where the client's coming from and to see that, uh, you know, uh, Often the budgets are quite large and like sometimes this is going to take someone, you know, six months of, of saving up their business income to be able to invest in you. And that's, a, you know, that's a pretty huge, uh, huge commitment. So we can't really take that lightly. We have to understand what it means, how much it means to the client to be able to do this. Exactly. Because I think some very powerful words in a negotiation are I understand. I which is very different from I agree. <laughs> um, so if they're, if they're struggling with an element of your proposal, if maybe it is the pricing and they're communicating to you, no, that's not working for me, I understand. How can we make it better? And um, so I guess another question on that would be, um, you know, let's say you have a great conversation with the client, you put together your proposal, you know, you feel pretty prepared, you put it together and you send it and you hear crickets chirping. Mm. Is there, are there any kind of rules in terms of, you know, how, how soon you might follow up with a client and, you know, again, find out, like, it, was there anything that I could have done differently? Do you ever follow up with, with people like that and just say, um, I'd love to know what I could have done differently to... Yeah, definitely. It's almost uh, the same sort of feel to when you've been interviewing for jobs and you didn't get the job. It's calling the HR department to figure out what you could have done differently. It's the same thing in your own business. <laughs> So even if the first follow-up, it's not to assume that you're not getting the job. Uh, try to have a positive outlook on it. But to wait maybe 48, 72 hours, follow up, see how it's going, ask if they have any questions. If you don't hear back, wait a little longer, maybe the next week. Um, but then definitely after about two or three, if you're not hearing anything back, Time, so then to move on. <laughs> time, to, time to move on. You can either ask, you know, what could I have done differently? Or if you really want to keep pursuing it, you could send over a slight tweak, which could come in. You know what? I had a brainwave last weekend. I was thinking about your project. Maybe something like this would be a better fit and sort of being proactive in coming up with a different solution. That could be something. That's great. Practice, preparation, proactiveness. Um, is there any other tips in terms of being prepared for that discussion that you can think of? Obviously doing a bit of research on your client, um, knowing what you're coming to the table with. So sort of like what, what price is going to make me happy? Like how many hours am I putting to get out of it? Um, any other interesting ways people can prepare to be really ready for what, you know, do you ever practice out loud? Do you? Yeah. <laughs> Well, some people really love role-playing a negotiation. Uh, it's not one of my favorite things, just because I think some people get very like, nervous and it, it becomes a bit dramatic. <laughs> um, I am a fan of repeating it out loud to yourself, like walking around the house, getting a, a sense for how the words will sound coming out of your mouth. That's helpful. And also preparing, but not sticking to absolutes. Um, there's not one magical combination of elements that you need to go with. So if you're thinking of the pricing, there'll be a range of numbers. When you're thinking about timeline, there'll be a range of timelines. And the better you can define the high end and the low end of those, the more flexibility you have to play with the different elements. It's kind of like a Mr. Potato Head. You've got all these different parts, you can put them together. If it's not working one way, you change it around. <laughs> I love that. I'm going to come up with a Mr. Potato Head graphic for this talk. <laughs> <laughs> I 
well, just like how important it is to be, yeah, to be flexible in negotiation and uh, yeah, flexible with yourself. And just just because you're not hitting the the top top end of what you wanted going in, doesn't mean you failed in some way. And I mean that actually reminds me of another sort of principle that I've been hearing uh, on the internet. And I'd love to know if you if you've been seeing this too. Is the importance of price tiers so that it's not a matter of am I hiring you or not? It's a matter of am I signing up for that top tier offering or the bottom tier? So I'd love to know if you've exactly. seen this in action. Like, do are price tiers really effective? Is there like a magical uh, two tiers, three tiers? They must be <laughs> this percentage. Yeah. There's so much like um, I'm going to call it science, quote unquote, behind how to set the different levels. Um, I'm a fan um, when it comes to packages of the three tier. I think that that gives you as the business owner a lot of flexibility for what you can include in each level. I think that there's some very clever work you can do with structuring your middle offer to make it look quite desirable. Um, as an attainable step up from the first level, but a whole lot of goodness. <laughs> um, in a negotiation over a contract or something, I like offering two options. So, okay, this section, the timeline, the guidelines aren't working for us. Would either A or B be a better choice? And that helps guide the client. Um, without giving them too many options and then that can get messy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and something I'm curious about too is because I do think there's a lot of power in the range, like showing that we don't know, we don't have enough detail yet. And so there is going to be a bit of flexibility after our discovery process. Mm -hmm. But how do you, how do you work with ranges and tiers? Like, can you have tiers of ranges or does that just <laughs> <laughs> Tier one is this range to this range, like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that could be nuts. Um, <laughs> so, so when might you use pricing tiers and when might you use a range? I'd be curious to know. How do you make those two ideas work together? I think if you're offering a package that sort of fits into three distinct tiers, that works well because it minimizes then your involvement in even having to negotiate. They sort of, I think clients will self-select into where they need to be. Um, I think ranges are really helpful if it's a more customized offering. Something like entering a strategic partnership to help them with their design for an entire year. That's going to be a range discussion. <laughs> there isn't going to be a nice neat package for that. But offering something sort of smaller in scale those could be predetermined. And is there any difference in how you might negotiate with a client versus someone that might be a partner? Um, I think the timeline, how, how far along you're considering. Um, with a client, my gut usually tells me to consider, you know, one to two years um, because I'm looking at how they might be my client right now, and then how I will grow along with them, how I might bring them along to work with me again later. Getting involved as a strategic partner, even if the agreement's only for a year, you're kind of in it for the long haul. The work you're doing is gonna be more strategic, more foundational, more business development for them. I think it serves both parties well to say, yes, we're, we're talking about a one-year engagement right now, but what's the actual business vision farther out? And then that's where you can play the game of the what-ifs and the how-abouts and what if we... <laughs> to make sure that that longer focus still works for both of you. I, I really like that idea, too, because I, I think a lot of people, um, a lot of designers specifically, once they've done the project, they've sort of forgotten and they're like, oh, no, now the client wants maintenance and I don't want to do maintenance. And so that might be something to think about even before you mm. give give a price is um, if you aren't interested in maintenance, you know, do you bring someone on to handle it for that client or do you continue with them in a strategic capacity but not um, on a technical end? So I think, um, as you're saying, it's really good to think about what could happen once that project finishes. What could that look like? And, um, you know, I'd love to know if this is something that, you know, in being proactive, do you ever 
you know, suggest to a client, hey, our engagement's coming to an end. I've really enjoyed working with you. I have some ideas for how we might continue working together. That's a great lead-in to the next contract. Exactly. I think yeah. there's such a, there's a fear for anyone in business of the unknown. So taking that chance to sign with someone for the very first time, once you're over that hurdle and you've delivered great content, you're personable, everything's worked out okay, even if it's not worked out 100% okay, but you've been able to work together successfully, oh, the barrier to signing that next contract just way down. Much easier. And I'd love to know, I mean, I feel like I kind of know what you're going to say here, but with some, <laughs> with some clients that I've worked with for a long, long time, we started with an initial contract, um, you know, that was signed, did the work, but, and then it evolved slowly. So maybe now it's hourly. Um, you know, do you, do you encourage people to kind of come up with a new agreement once that starts? I mean, I've just, I know I've been casual about clients that I've worked with in a really long-term capacity where it seems a little overkill to say, okay, we're going to work X many hours because we don't really know how many hours we're going to work. So do you feel like that? Um, do you need to set, you know, new terms and new contract when you move into a slightly different type of work or do you think it's based on each client? Definitely client based. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into building a contract and if you don't need to do it, you can use that time for something else. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and uh, in, in terms of client uh, uh, contract clauses, mm -hmm. are there any specific ones that you, you would say like, you know, make sure for sure to have this in your contract because it saves your butt in terms of future negotiations. Are there some like key ones that, you're, that you've seen have been really, really good to include in your contract? Um, well, beyond the basic sort of liability, <laughs> limiting your liability, um, covering your intellectual property. Um, one thing that I think gets misunderstood a lot of the time is licensing and how much yes. leeway your client will then have. Um, I guess this is a, a great time to mention I'm not a lawyer, um, but I've worked sort of between legal and business for a lot of years, so I speak legal. <laughs> Handy. <laughs> I can figure it out. Um, so not a lawyer, but definitely something like licensing, um, copyright, getting a really good sense of that. I think those sections of a contract are usually not a lot of fun to read. They're the heaviest language. So taking your time with them, uh, finding outside resources or glossaries. I know a lot of the design guilds, the freelancers uh, union have glossaries that help explain in everyday English what you'll actually be signing. Um, and a lot of what I love about a contract is that yes, it will be very formal. You'll have all your legal aspects covered, but it can be very operational. So setting guidelines within your contract of what material the client needs to provide to you when they need to provide it and what the project timeline will be. Because a lot of discussion seems to happen around like, well, you didn't send me the draft, so now I can't proceed. So now the whole project's off its timeline and it creates noise. You can actually get rid of that by laying out your process within your contract. Love that. And, um, and again, so you were saying your process is a two-step process. So you put together, um, I assume to some extent, your proposal might be a little less formal, right? So it's more like, mm -hmm. forgive me if I'm, if I'm putting words in your mouth, but you know, the way I do my proposals is a little more aspirational. Like, here's, here's the overview. Here's what I'm seeing. Here's what I think is possible. Yeah. Here's the range. Great. And like, let's just make sure you know, at a ballpark level, we're on the same page. Great. Mm -hmm follow up with that slightly more formal thing that yeah. says like, okay, now that you've, you know, that we're on the same page, here are the timelines, here are the deadlines, here's what I expect of you, here's what you can expect of me, and that's a little more formal. Fabulous. Yeah, that's exactly right. Because there's no point jumping straight to a rather heavy contract and dealing with all that language if you're not even in the same ballpark or playing the same game. Yeah, and that can take a lot of time to put together if, uh, you know, to put that much time into a proposal and a contract when the client was not even really interested or maybe they're just <laughs> exactly. kicking tires in the first place. Yeah, um, 
or if they're going to be really firm on wanting a whole new website in two days. <laughs> so, and, no, that's sorry. something I'd be I'd be curious about too. Like, let's say somebody comes to you with a very low ball offer. Um, you know, when is there room to negotiate, and when is it? Um, hey, we're actually just not a good fit because you're expecting a ridiculous amount. You know, for for very little. So, do you do you have any sort of you know clues or signs for when to, when to turn somebody away, when to actually say? hey, there's a bit of an educational component where you say, mm. here's why I charge what I do, whether it's a, a hidden you know, page on your site where it's like, what goes into a website? Here's why I charge what I do. Yeah, I think it's, unless the offer is like ridiculous, like $10, um, it's worth having one follow-up communication. And it can be something, it's already put together, it could be a one-pager PDF that, as you said, educates them, sets out, an expectation of the time and the value and the potential price point for them. Um, because maybe they just really honestly didn't know. They, they had no clue. So it would be a shame to turn away a client who actually could afford you because you didn't take the opportunity to educate them on it. That's that's a great point, and that's something that we've we've talked about quite a bit in the group too. Is um, in all, when I think about almost all of the clients that have come to me that you know had a fairly large budget in the end. When they first came to me, their budget was actually quite small, and in fact, almost half of what we mm -hmm. we ended up spending. And it wasn't until getting on a phone call, sometimes even talking up to an hour, sometimes even an hour and a half. At, at that point, you've already. Like you've established a relationship and a connection. We've painted the vision for what the future looks like, and yeah. they're so excited and they're so on board. Get that proposal sent pretty soon after that call. And, <laughs> exactly. and, um, and I think they've, through that conversation, they've seen that what's possible is much greater than what they had initially mm -hmm. envisioned. And so I think that being willing to invest a bit more in that initial conversation has, has had a huge payoff. And so you know, I encourage people, when someone says they have a budget, um, it, that's not always necessarily fixed, right? And so if they see the sort of, oh, wow, I see what's possible, let me see if I can find a little bit more, more budget. <laughs> exactly. It's like when they put you in to test drive the car with the heated seats. And you're and like, like oh, oh, hello. <laughs> so you gotta make them, you got to make them envision what the heated seats are going to feel like. I love that. Buttons all yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> awesome. Um. Are there any other like major tips that you can think of for, for someone that's like a little nervous or, or maybe that's been chronically undercharging and you, even mm -hmm. to kind of get out of that, that mindset and to understand how much value you're giving away um, and how much is being left on the table. And, um, and, I, and I'm sure negotiating has repercussions even in everyday life. Like you were saying, being comfortable asking for things. So it's again, not just in monetary terms, but in many yeah. other ways. I think it, it is, um, especially if you've been undercharging for a while, you know that you should be charging more. Like everyone is telling you you should be charging more. Even your clients. Exactly. <laughs> right? Sometimes you have a client saying, you should know. Like, uh oh, wait a minute. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, it's good to remind yourself you don't have to do it all at once. Um, so even if you're currently charging half of what you should, the idea of sending over a doubled rate to an existing client is going to bring up a lot of crap. That's going to be really hard. But if maybe you stepped them up, so one, it's more comfortable for them to not be getting a 100% rate increase. <laughs> but it's also more comfortable for you to really confidently say, okay, it's going to go up by 50%. And you may not be able to step them up to what you should be at within a year even. It, it might take you time, it might be multiple projects, but you're making the move in the right direction. And because you're confident at each one of those steps, it's going to be a lot easier to communicate the value to, I don't always like the word justify, because I don't think you really have to justify charging what you're value is, but um, it, it definitely will smooth the process. And besides, when you get that first plus 50%, the momentum, the energy, like how awesome that will feel. Get that first momentum. Uh, yeah. That's get, great. It's a little quicker win 
even if it's for a smaller amount. Quick wins, small amounts. And so I assume that would be the same, like let's say you've had a client you've been working with for a while, you're wanting to raise your rates and you know you don't want to lose that client and so mm -hmm. I imagine some of your older clients you might want to like slowly step them up and just say hey in January and hey in June and just let them know exactly step it up um, you can also make the decision for your business that if it's a wonderful client that you've worked with forever and they're really low maintenance you can leave them at an old rate I mean you're, you're the boss no one says that every single client has to be moved up that pricing ladder um, yeah so again it, it's up it's up to you you have the control over that and I so I know we talked a little bit about um, what happens when you're in a project and you realize oh gosh like I, I totally underestimated this I'd love to know if you have any tactics for um, you know, like you want to keep the relationship smooth, but you know, do, do you have to kind of bite the bullet on that because you underestimate it or what kind of flexibility um, or are there any, any specific wording or terms that you find work really well when you're trying to address this as a kind of difficult uh, conversation? Hmm. Um, I think it's important to, with any client, you'll have sort of milestones or status meetings, checkups. Um, a smoother way of having that discussion is to align it with one of those scheduled calls or meetings rather than an out of the blue like hey we need to talk <laughs> that never goes well no um, well, we need to talk no, okay. no one likes to do that <laughs> so, so say okay status update this is where we are with the project and then this is how things have been coming along on my side I wanted to talk to you because it seems like <laughs> the, the hours or the time or whatever the concern is for you, it's not matching up with what we pictured originally. So I wanted to get a sense from you, client, if everything is coming together the way you saw it happening. Um, so you sort of put your cards onto the table to say something's not quite right on my side, but you're not blaming them. You're, starting a discussion that maybe you're also seeing something that's not working. What if the client's like, everything's good on my end, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? <laughs> well, that's when you kind of have to put on your big girl pants <laughs> and say, okay, well, from my end, no, this, this really isn't working. Again, it's, I love working with you. We've made great progress. I'm excited about XYZ that we've accomplished together. Um, but I'm, I'm concerned that I may not be able to continue delivering with the same enthusiasm or excellent results based on whatever my issue is. Worded that so nicely. <laughs> I'm concerned that I'm not able to deliver with the same enthusiasm. <laughs> okay, and so what if the client is sort of resistant um you know is there any kind of tips you'd give for, do you at some point have to suck it up and say well you know it's in my contract i kind yeah. of underquoted i didn't really factor those things in do you you know personally take the hit on that and just say well this is kind of a learning lesson and next time i better pad my my <laughs> estimates a little more sometimes you'll have to um not every client is going to be flexible with you not every contract will have a nice piece of language that allows you that opportunity to renegotiate and it is you know your options at that point are to continue to deliver high standard of product because that's what you do you're a professional um, and wait out until the end of the contract or to use a termination clause and to, to end it early on your side any any tips when it comes to uh termination to kind of just keep keep integrity and kind of keep things as you know ended on as good a note as you can yeah i think termination from something like that would be a real last resort um for example if this project were taking up so much of your time that you weren't able to bring on a new client who would actually help you pay your rent um that might be when termination uh, the opportunity cost there is too big but to follow the absolute letter of the contract. If it's a 30-day notice, written notice, 
that's what you provide. Um, and then I think from the relationship management point, it's going above and beyond in terms of preparing final or final progress files that they can then hand off to the next designer or maybe referring them to someone else who can finish that part of the job. Um, but I'd say more often than not, it's probably better from a professionalism and relationship point of view to kind of suck it up and finish out the contract. I've definitely done that before where I was like, whoops, did not ask enough questions there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is good. I mean, it's an important to actually learn from it. You know, you make the mistake once and then the next time your intake questions are all different, your contract's going to be a little different. Each time it gets yeah. tighter and tighter. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's essentially how, um, I guess, large corporations, they'll have started with one contract and then every year there's a new edition coming out and it's all the lessons learned put into that new document. Yeah, contract should be accumulation of all the lessons learned. <laughs> Of which there are many. Um, there are always, always. So anything else to help people, um, you know, get better at this? Obviously practice is going to, it's going to take some time to get comfortable with that. Any books you'd recommend, like even for just mindset or kind of um, any good reads that you've, that you've had? Um, it's funny, I actually avoid reading a lot of negotiation books. <laughs> Um, and I think, I think it's because it's better to learn from experience with mm -hmm. it. Because a lot of the books, because I have read them in the past, um, they're very prescriptive mm -hmm. and they'll get you really excited about something. And then you close the book and you go out into the world and do your business and you're like, ooh, wait a minute. <laughs> That's not exactly what I thought it would be. There's almost an awkwardness or a disconnect where your your mindset isn't quite ready or the experience isn't ready, and so you're you almost feel like you're putting on big big shoes, and you're like, this feels awkward. <laughs> like you're not yeah. quite ready. For yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like putting on that navy blue suit to be all like super professional, but it's not you. Um, and yeah. any any tactics for? Um, I know I know this trips a lot of people up, but when someone asks you for a price right on the spot. Um, you know, to say something like, I need some time to get back to you about that, or like, you know, I need to do some research on that. Mm -hmm. Like, what are some good scripts to kind of like not, you know, say a low number right away just because you feel like, oh gosh, I gotta, you know. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, you can't take it back out. <laughs> You're like, oh, it's only this much great. I'd love to work with you on that. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, I think especially if they've asked you for a number really early in a conversation. Um, to one, forgive them for being a little, like, rude about it. <laughs> it shouldn't be the first 30 seconds of your conversation. Um, but to try and turn the conversation back to be about them as quickly as possible. And it would be, you, you know what, I, right now I'm not going to be able to give a price, but your project sounds really interesting. Let's talk a bit more about what you see happening. and Because they're probably really excited about what they're working on. Um, so that works twofold. It gets the focus off your price and it also helps you collect a lot of really good information that you can then use to shape the best possible offer for them. Which you need, yeah, that information. You need all that, like as much juicy info as you can get. That's great. Um, and so you said you had a challenge for people to take on. <laughs> My challenge is that for everyone in their business, there's one thing that when they think about doing it, they groan, either out loud or inside. <laughs> so my challenge is to pick one thing from this past week that you have felt not hot about in your business and figure out three small ways you could change it. Three really small asks that you can make so that it's better the next time around. Awesome. Three ways, three small asks, something you could make, um, or something you could ask to make something better in your business, something that's been making you groan, whether it's 
I know I need to update that proposal document or I know I need to, you know, follow up with that client or train a client or whatever it is. Yeah. Or it's really annoying when someone sends you a PDF or a Word doc when they could send you a link to a Google doc. So your ask is to say, hi, for the next time, could you please send me a Google doc? It's funny how difficult it can be to ask something very small, right? It's, yeah. But if you've been getting a little, you know, PO'd every time that PDF has arrived <laughs> in your inbox. Yeah, that's definitely something that I'm a huge proponent of is if, if you find yourself being resentful about something, there's usually room to either set an expectation, make an ask, you know, um, what do you need to ask your client for so that you're, you're going to stop being resentful towards them, I think is really important. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I love your blog. I love your site. I think it's excellent. I think you're, um, I, I love what you're doing and obviously like helping entrepreneurs get, you know, um, build better businesses. So where can people find you online? Uh, online, I'm at devinsmiley.com. Uh, so that's D-E-V-O-N-S-M-I-L-E-Y. Is that your real name, by the way? Yeah. <laughs> that's an amazing name. Like, Devin Smiley, the negotiation consultant. That's, that's pretty yeah. awesome. I mean, everyone thinks I should have become a dentist. That would just be perfect. You're the super friendly negotiation consultant. <laughs> Woo! And it's funny, that actually has worked well for me because uh, in corporate, I was rather young, female, and my name is Smiley. And I'm kind of a friendly, bubbly person. So they wouldn't suspect a thing. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's amazing too. I'm, I'm curious about, um, there's got to be some ge you know, gender differences when it comes to how men and women negotiate. And I know there's like research that, sh that sort of backs this up. Has it been a challenge for you? Have you seen it in, in the corporate world? I, I think I've seen it, I've seen the starts of it and then um, I've seen it actually turn to my advantage, perhaps. Um, because I, I love being the underdog. I dare <laughs> you, I dare you to think that I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and that has, has driven me and it, it drove me in all of my big negotiations. Do you know what? I had all my research done. I knew my stuff cold, you know, blown out of the water. <laughs> I love that. Absolutely love that. Underdog is definitely a term I, I can relate to. And I know with sort of women in tech, there's a lot of, you know, things happening, at least in the startup space that are, um, you know, not so pretty there. But I think things are changing. And I, I see so many women starting online businesses, which is super, super exciting. And so I feel like at least for me, it's worked to my advantage to be a woman in a more sort of technical field. Because you know, I've noticed that a lot of women entrepreneurs want to support other women entrepreneurs and uh, don't mean to make this, uh, you know, discussion just mostly female, but it's 98% of 99% of DSS is, is women. Mm. And so I do think we do have some interesting uh, challenges to, to work through. Yeah, I think as soon as business, we realize it's more about relationships. That's people is everything, right? If, no. Yeah, if you don't if you don't understand people, you don't understand business. I think was what uh, uh, Simon Sinek said, mm -hmm. which I can totally totally relate to. And I think it's um, it's something that I've encouraged a lot of designers to do that used to do their projects all by email and never hop mm -hmm. on the phone or never do a Skype call. But I feel like once you're willing to kind of um, get through that that scariness and be willing to meet someone face to face, there's there's so much opportunity to uh, to get more of what you want. Exactly. That's Love awesome. it. Yeah. Thank you so much for all your tips. This is really great. I'm going to oh, my pleasure. This was fun. Yeah. So, summarize some of this. And um, again, like I love, I love your blog. Um, I'll definitely be keeping up and uh, letting people know where they can find you because I think it's it's really great what you're doing. Super. Thanks so much, uh, Marie. Thanks a lot, Devin. <laughs>